Hello and welcome to Mercer's Hidden Past, a weekly podcast brought to you by Cavartha Castle Museum and Art Gallery. My name is Christopher Parry and I work at Cavartha Castle and this podcast is all about Mercer Tidville where Cavartha Castle is and yeah it's about the hidden stories in Mercer's past rather than the ones that you can easily find out by a quick search of Google or anything like that. And so last week we looked at a letter from the collection held at Kavartha Castle Museum. And thank everyone so much for kind of being so kind and nice with the comments on the last couple of episodes, really. Everyone seems to have really enjoyed the last few episodes that we put out there, which is really, really good to you, to be honest, because I, I live in a bubble at the moment with the coronavirus pandemic. And I don't I don't get to speak to a lot of people like many of you out there, don't, don't sure. So it's like I'm talking to myself in a room and then you hear it and I never know what anyone thinks until you tell me. So it's nice to hear. But yeah, this week we're going to be focusing on um, a unique part of Merthyr's history, really. Um, it's a part of Merthyr called China, and some people may have heard of it. It was renowned to be a criminal empire within Merthyr, and we're going to be looking at it, but looking at it and trying to find out how it was an empire based upon prostitution more than anything else. And yeah, so have a have a listen. If you like, please share it and comment and get it out there as much as possible. But I will stop waffling on now and get to the subject at hand. So I hope you enjoy. In the Morning Chronicle, which is a London newspaper, that appeared at, at an introduction of sorts to China, which I'll read to you now, because it kind of lays the foundation to how a lot of people perceived and saw China at the time. They started off as follows. There is a quarter of the town extending along a flat on the right bank of the River Taff, from the lowest point of the high street towards Kavartha, the proper name of which is Pont Stow House. But like the unhappy, lawless people who inhabit it, the place has an alias, and it is generally known by the name of China. The houses are mere huts stone low, confined, ill-lit and unventilated. They are built without pretensions to regularity and form a maze of courts and treacherous lanes, hardly passable in many places for house refuge, rubbish and filth. In some places they are considerably below the level of the road, and the descent is by ladders. Such houses are called the cellars. Here it is, in the congenial atmosphere, the crime, disease and penury of Merthyr Tidville, for the most part, live. Thieves, prostitutes, vagrants, the idols, the reckless, the desolate, all you live in miserable companionship. Merthyr China has achieved almost mythical status amongst the history of Merthyr Tidville. Many historians put it up against Whitechapel in London and many other dens of iniquity scattered throughout Victorian Britain. But I don't expect everybody to know where China is in Merthyr, so first and foremost we're going to start with a brief idea of where in Merthyr China was. Simple as that. China formed part of a larger area that was known as Pont Storehouse. Now, Pont Storehouse loosely translates as bridge to the storehouses. And that bridge that it's referring to is Jackson's Bridge, which is still standing in Merthyr Tidville and is next to what used to be known as the Wellington Pub. I think it's now the Red Spice Indian. And with Dixon Street on the eastern side and then Georgetown on the western side of the bridge. And so that is where China was, on the eastern side of that bridge, but it was lower than the, what the level of the road is now. Because if you go to Dixon Street and Jackson's Bridge now, the whole road is lifted up. But China was originally 12 feet below the level of the road, which is really important, which I, is why I mention it. Because if you walk through Victorian Merthyr, and you walked along that street, you wouldn't be naturally guided into China. Because if you walked along Bethesda Street, you would see quite nice shop windows and pubs and things like that. But then you might see an archway. And in that archway is a staircase that led down. And you go down 12 foot or so, and then you end up in China. So China was almost kind of, you couldn't see it from the main road. On the western side of it, it was walled in by the River Taff. 
on the eastern side it was walled in by different buildings and on the on the southern end it was walled in by the Bethesda cinder tip and so China was really a kind of very hidden guarded little hovel which is why it kind of got this reputation more than anything because it wasn't really invisible sight so people often used it to do more underhanded things obviously mainly prostitution and theft so prostitution and theft and then violence and drunken disorderly behavior that would spread from that activity was rife in china but it didn't it wasn't suddenly named china one day someone didn't just wake up and go oh that place is china it did actually have a few different names scattered over the years and the major ones are that it would just be called plant storehouse in general the other main one is the cellars which is referring to the level of it because it was below the level of the road the cellars 12 feet below the road the houses got that name cellar because they down low and it got quite a reputation back in the end of the 1830s because this is when Merthyr's population was really hitting all new figures and, and blowing all records in Wales out of the water it was at the end of that 1830s period that Pont Storehouse and China and the Cellars started getting a name for itself. Namely, there was a gang that was called the Pont Storehouse Gang, and this is this first kind of indication of the press being interested in covering this because there was members of the Hudson family, the Watkins family, and there was a, a prostitute named Mary Davis who was nicknamed Mary Strap, and they were all regularly thieving and pinching and and beating people up in general really i mean one example would be mary guided a gentleman down into an alleyway and immediately started feeling his pockets he was like what what's going on and then behind him was a couple of blows from a gentleman who didn't want him making any fuss really and then they beat him and robbed him and that happened all the time and this gang got a reputation as being known as the pont storehouse gang long before china became known as china so sellers was one name for china but then the name china was the one that really solidified it in murthy's history because it's so different from everything else and historians have been trying to kind of gauge why the name china had came in many many times over but it's fairly straightforwardly simple when you kind of look through the newspaper accounts and other things as to why china was known as china it was nothing to do with opium nothing to do with chinese people living in nothing to do with that it's a simple fact that it was to do with tea the temperance movement in merthyr was a massive thing and there was a wesleyan chapel and two wesleyan chapels on merthyr's high street and the wesleyans and a person named father watkins who was part of the wesleyan chapel was a big a big part of the temperance movement and he despised this kind of culture of alcoholism and debauchery that was growing as he seed as he saw rather from china and from Kadrau. So in Kadrau and which is another part of Merthyr, in those two locations, the sellers and Kadrau, he would hold sermons on a weekly basis on Sundays and try and convert people to give over to alcoholism uh, to, to not give in to alcoholism rather and instead drink tea as a viable alternative, pushing that part of the temperance movement to drink tea as an alternative to alcohol and all that. He ended up with little to no success in China and converting people. In fact, the newspapers often took the mick out of him um, in various points, saying he converted one person. But ever since he tried to convert people, people started calling the area in around 1843, Little China or China Vach. And after that, it was just shortened again to just simply China. And it was simply named China because of this kind of promotion tea over alcohol it all ties in as well when you kind of look at it because father father watkins's sermons were all happening in the first part of 1843 and the first time china is named china appears in that same year as well later on in that year so china is already kind of setting itself out apart from other locations where criminal activity is happening because the location is almost like uh, if you were if you were putting a fictional novel down and you created this perfect little criminal location 
it would be like with only one entrance in through a dingy artway 12 foot below the road it would be full of debauchery and alcohol and all that type of thing that's not to say that there weren't hundreds of normal people there going out working because there was when you look at uh, reports from china censuses and other things like that you see that there are hundreds upon hundreds of normal everyday people working as puddlers as miners as everything you can imagine but then there was this criminal element there the murtha despised and that the press then pushed and advertised through the roof because when it achieved that china name it started all of these other things coming with it so they give it they give the place an emperor and an empress so that china needs an emperor and an empress so they give the biggest criminal as they saw it in the press the name emperor of china and then his girlfriend would be the empress of china and all this kind of melodramatic fictionalization of crime started happening massively in the press more often than not the criminality in china revolved around a certain a certain thing and that was theft theft of money and of property and of clothing and of food and all that type of thing larceny was the biggest single crime in china and the prostitutes would be a part an integral part of organizing that crime they had some amazing names for prostitutes as well in the in the victorian period in mirtha some of them called them nymphs of the pave one was called angels with clipped wings and just the most absurd things you've ever heard but anyway the prostitutes would normally have a person with them we now would call them a pimp but back in the day they would be called a bully and the bullies in china would be kind of the hard man they normally kind of welsh in their 20s laborers strong guys and what well, they are there to do essentially is to make sure that nothing happens to the girl because that girl is paying them they her cut they split in whatever profit she gets with him so he's there as her protector but not only that is a lot of the time they play in a game in terms of the woman is drawing a man in to china and then while he's distracted with the woman the man then comes up behind him knocks him out or beats him up violently and then takes his money and that's kind of the game and a lot of people in china would get caught this way you'd often the prostitutes in china would do something that i i every time i read this in the press and i read it quite often it would always make me laugh and they would do this all the time so many guys got caught this way it was it's brilliant i think to be honest because more fool them in, in, in all honesty is the the women would entice them into a bedroom down in china they would you know agree a fee or whatever bring them down into the house in china and then the man would start undressing and then she'd ask him to lie down and then they would grab all his clothes and run out to the house and lo and behold they didn't even live in the house they reported it they were just kind of they were just using it as a door house as a brothel or whatever someone else's house was kind of they were giving him a couple of pence for it and then the guy is kind of obviously not going to give chase because he hasn't got trousers on so he's kind of stuck there and they get away scot-free and steal all his money which happened so many times so many men were left trouserless trouserless in china in the 1840s and 50s you wouldn't believe it honestly the press even started handing out or printing rather warnings in the newspaper saying caution to strangers the sellers have again been the scene of some infamous practices and they were referring to at the time two men just arriving this is in 1846 two men arriving in the town looking for work and not being familiar with china is what they were saying which is, i i'm not sure they were uh, i'm not sure is true rather but they were accosted by a nymph with with the blandest of smiles the newspaper said and the young woman took a took them into one of the dens in the cellars and they who and her mother made a meal apparently according to the guys there was nothing untoward going on at all but apparently they ended up sleeping in the house no one talked about any sex or anything like that that never happened according to this newspaper account but yeah and they then they were awoken with having all of their possessions being stolen while they were asleep and then when they woke up 
bullies came in which were assisting the, these two women and beat them up and then they had to go to the police to try and solve the whole crime and it's time and time again the same kind of crimes kept coming up in that way really the names of some of the prostitutes as well and the aliases they were given like mary bootstrap and jane thomas who was alias was big jane uh, <laughs> Look, they're just ridiculous names that are associated with these but they pop up in the press time and time and time again like take for instance uh, just in just within a couple of months in 1847 Anne Evans and Catherine Watkins were charged with robbing David Thomas of a Saturday night they just they obviously appeared and tried to distract him and then pickpocketed him Jane, Big Jane, who I just mentioned, was arrested for being drunk and disorderly in the early hours and assaulting another woman from the town. Hannah Stiles, another prostitute from Merthyr, was charged by another prostitute from China, rather, with assaulting her. Um, Anne Green, who the newspapers describe as a very pretty young lady from the Celestial Empire, with a bonnet rigged out in all the colours of the rainbow, was charged with pickpocketing a guy called Thomas Davis with uh, 30 shillings on his person. And it, it goes on and on and on and on and on. But the weird thing is, is when you get these long, long articles, they always tend in the press to focus more on the male characters, and obviously, it's just a general kind of siding of the male story over the female story in this period, which is quite often the case, really. But it it is definitely the case that female prostitution, female theft, was the most prolific in terms of sheer numbers of crimes coming out of China by far and away. And all of the criminality was connected in some way to those prostitutes, whether they were bullies being violent towards them or whether it, it, it all revolved around that core prostitution within China. And I think this is why it kind of offended a lot of Victorian kind of ideals and ways and why China was kind of targeted more than any other part of Merthyr. Because it was certainly crime galore happening all over Merthyr. You know, there were other brothels and other places in Merth and other violent crimes happening, other murders, loads of things happening. But China was seen separately to this. And it was probably partly to do with the press coverage of China and how the police almost took it as an affront that that they'd even there to be taken the mickey of and saying, oh, China again, or the sellers again, or this crime or that crime. And so the police really targeted from 1844 to 47, they really targeted China and China's population and they tried to transport and get rid of as many criminals as they saw it as possible. In 1847, it's an interesting year that because the police fully have an all-out war to end the criminality in China. They throw everything they've got at it. Newspaper articles appear saying war in China and all this type of thing. And it says that within a 12-month period between 1846 and 1847, they've arrested over 50 of the most notorious characters from this disreputable district, charging them from all manner of crimes, from stealing from people, highway robbery, theft, any number of different things. There was such a lack of criminals about the end of 1847 that the newspapers even reported quite sarcastically on the fact they called it a deserted village. They said that the China Vach had fallen into a condition of emptiness and a sorrowful public surrounded them as the last and only remaining fairyland is about to be rudely closed and all that type of thing. And they really wax lyrical about how so many people have been sent away and how the high the heights of criminality of china are now long gone if you needed any more convincing from me that china was built on the female prostitution and that criminal and that criminal element was at the heart of this reputation you just look at the 50 criminals that they are talking about in this year in 1847. When they discuss the 50 notorious criminals being sent out, they name a few in the press. They name the Hudson family. They name Benjamin Blackstone, the emperor of China at the time, and all these men. And they 
leave out a massive chunk which is a fundamental part of that all when you break it down 11 out of the 50 convictions are male and 39 are female so 39 out of 50 are the most notorious criminals china has and they were the ones that were being the war was being pitted against by the police essentially obviously more criminals would come along and fill the void and more prostitutes would come along and do the jobs and the theft that was happening previously but it does very much seem like that the local police force got a grip and got a hold on the activity in china during the 1840s and it was never quite as prolific and as widespread as it seems to be as presented in the press and the police report as it was in the 1840s Now, don't get me wrong, it wasn't as if China's criminality disappeared all of a sudden and it totally changed and was a a proper fairyland. It literally, though, it stopped being as prevalent a problem in terms of poor, the amount of criminals going on there, the amount of criminality happening there, rather. The first emperor of Merthyr's China was transported in 1847 as well. His name was Benjamin Richards, or Benny Blackstone, or as the press like to call him, the emperor of China. He was actually part of the newspaper article that's the earliest known uh, appearance of China being called China in the press, at least, anyway. And yeah, he was an emperor from 1843 up to 1847. But he was caught for committing highway robbery and transported for seven years. He was meant to be transported, but he was kept on what's called a prison hulk, which are these big old naval vessels that are stationed out on the coast of England and the surrounding areas of Britain, really. And what essentially they were is Victorian Britain was running out of prison spaces, mainly because they were convicting people for any, any crime possible, really. And they created these naval vessels to be float in prisons while people await transportation and all that. And these things were horrendous in every way, full of disease, very close quarters, sharing it with hundreds of people. So Benjamin Richards ended up on one of those, but then was pardoned, strangely, in 1850 and ended ended up coming back to Merthyr Tidville and then appearing still in the press as late as 1866 with the press still saying the ex-emperor of China he's never resumed his despotic sway over the over the celestial empire of China and all that type of thing so even when he's come back and he's not doing any crime he's still a point of interest for the press and things like that but yeah China as 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 a whole in Merthyr Tidville is, is a unique thing and it has very much turned into a mythical a creation nowadays and even so much as other criminality and other crimes throughout the town get kind of associated and latched on but it was very much through this 1840s period that it achieved this name, this reputation and it achieved the top heights really because every year that went forward from that year the Merthyr's police got better and more equipped and more armed to deal with large-scale criminality, really. And so it became harder and harder and harder for that type of thing to exist in the way that it did back in the 1840s. But even as late as 1870s and 1880s and 1890s even, people were still talking about China. People were still going to investigate China and going inside and seeing what they could find and telling stories about if you go into China, you will never find your way back out and even policemen are afraid to go in there. And there's not much truth or reality to a lot of it, but ultimately the stories have stuck But the one thing that I always find really strange is how it's never really talked about how this whole empire, this whole criminal network was really built upon the back of female prostitution and female pickpocketing and theft, really, which in many ways is is a strange thing to not really be talked about much at all and not be looked at as a, as a real interesting study of, okay, what was happening en masse to all these young women to push them into this area where they are prostituting themselves, they are thieving and they are pinching and they are being violent and alcoholic. What is going on in the community of Merthyr to push these women to the fringes of society in that way. 
But anyway, I've gone on long enough about Mercer's China and about prostitutes, I'm sure. So it leaves me just to say thank you very much for listening as ever. And I hope you've enjoyed and learned a bit about Mercer's China and why it's an interesting case study for Mercer more than anything. Weirdly, China now, Mercer's China, is coming on to the Welsh curriculum soon. So a lot more school kids will be finding out about Mercer's um, history with China and this prostitution and the bullies and all that type of thing. So yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed Please like it, comment on it, share it as much as possible as always. But I will be back with you next week with another story from Murtha's Hidden Past. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe.